Would you pay more attention to me if I did this? Or this? How about this? We live in a world that likes to put the filter on, don't we? But what if some of God's best blessings came from truth without the filter? That's what my brand new book, Jesus Hashtag No Filter, is all about. It dives into some of Jesus' toughest teachings, but reminds us that within them we find unfailing love, stable truth, and God's help for our toughest times. It proves to you why Jesus, he may be difficult, but he's always worth following. In early 2023, two American sports commentators clashed over who was following the real Jesus. Uh, on the one side was former NFL coach and Super Bowl champion, now NFL commentator Tony Dungy. Maybe you've heard of him. And the other side was sports writer and USA Today columnist Nancy Armour. Uh, the online dispute started when Tony Dungy apparently tweeted something that he later found out not to be true. I believe it was in the, uh, the camp of some comment about gender, transgenderism. He found out that he shared something that wasn't factual, and he said, as a Christian, that was not okay. It wasn't okay to spread false news, to give false testimony against everyone. He needed to own the sin that he had committed, and so he publicly apologized for it. But Nancy Armour didn't accept the apology. Instead, she wrote an article trying to show that Tony Dungy's problem was much bigger than a mistaken tweet the problem was that he wasn't representing the real Jesus. She said this, quote, If you're a Christian, you're supposed to follow the teachings of Christ. Christ preached love and acceptance. He embraced lepers and prostitutes and hated tax collectors. Christ had no use for those who proclaimed their piety while using it to demean and mistreat others. Unquote. Uh, Tony and Nancy held and still hold two very different positions on a very important moral issue of our day. But if you'd ask them, why do you hold this or why do you hold that, both of them would say, Jesus. Have you noticed this at all? In some of the biggest uh, moral and cultural debates of our generation, it's really, really rare to find someone who says that they disagree with Jesus that they hate the teaching of Jesus, that they believe that they know better than Jesus. Instead, what so often happens is people on side A and side B both claim that they're representing Jesus. You know, for example, if you ask someone, you know, why go to church? Why be part of an organized religion and just instead of having some personal relationship with God, a, a simple answer for many church people would be, uh, Jesus. Jesus attended the synagogue. He was part of organized religion. He appointed apostles and structure their first century churches. He always wanted us to be part. Jesus himself organized his religion. Therefore, you should be part of an organized religion. But other people would say, well, wait, no. wasn't Jesus like the hugest critic of organized religion? Didn't he fight most, not with unbelieving people, but those who claimed to lead the church weren't his fiercest enemies, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their hypocrisy and greed? Or think of something like uh, traditional family and sexual and gender values. If you ask someone why they hold to maybe the same beliefs that their grandparents did, instead of what's very common in our culture, they might respond, uh, Jesus. Jesus was the one who defined marriage as a man and a woman. He was the one in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 who quoted back to the early days of Genesis to talk about these traditional values. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but this is what Jesus taught. I'm not changing my beliefs because Jesus doesn't change. But then other people would say, but, but, but didn't Jesus almost always take the side of those who are on the margins those who were judged by religious leaders, isn't it true that he did reach out to tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and people who didn't have their place in the organized church and he loved them and sided with them? If you ask some people, you know, why on social media are you 
speaking about other people's lifestyles. Why are you critical and judgmental? They would say, well, because, because of Jesus. You have to stand up for what's true. You have to stand up for justice. People can't just claim to follow God and do whatever they want. He doesn't change. That's why I'm doing this. And other people would say, well, wait, isn't Jesus the one who said, do not judge, period, love one another, period? God is love, and the world will know that you're following God by the way that you love one another? You see what I'm saying? No one says, I'm anti-Jesus. Almost everyone on this side and the other side says that Jesus is on my side. It's kind of confusing, isn't it? Like, if you care about Jesus like I do, if you want to follow him faithfully like I do, if you want to be true to him, in fact, worship him like I do, how do you know what the real Jesus is like? Well, there's a simple answer to that question. You've you got to throw yourself into the unfiltered Jesus. Right? The truth is, you can make any claim and believe anything if you just pick and choose a word, a sentence, a paragraph. The, the thing that's actually a lot of work for you and me is to dig into this Jesus enough that we understand what he said in the context of why he said it, what came before it, what comes after it, what did Matthew say, and then Mark, and then Luke, and then John. We have to get huge chunks of Jesus so he can interpret himself instead of people like me or people like you imposing an interpretation that we prefer. And uh, that's why I'm glad you're here today. That's why I'm happy you're watching online because in this sermon series, we're trying to get back to the unfiltered Jesus by turning to the Gospel of John. Uh, John, if you don't know, was one of Jesus' closest friends, and he recorded some of Jesus' longest teachings. Uh, we're trying to cover as many of them as we can. Um, I can't cover every verse, so it's probably important for you to read the whole Gospel of John. You could do it in less time than it takes to watch an NFL football game. Hashtag, no more excuses. <laughs> right, there's not too much. But I love the Gospel of John because what Jesus says time and time and time and time and time and time again is, I am blank. Right? Jesus wants to know, you want to know what I'm like? I'm this, I'm that, I'm like this, I'm not like that. Jesus himself, from his own lips, doesn't just say it. He then spends a lot of time, some pretty long chapters, explaining what he means. And today he's going to do it again. Um, today Jesus is going to say something very Simple, but when you think about it, it's very profound that helps us understand who he is, what he's like, and what he likes. Uh, let me read to you an epic verse from John chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus tells us what he's like. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, quote, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life, unquote. Jesus said he is the light. And you can learn a lot about what Jesus is like if you, you think kind of deeply about what light is and what light does. So I did some research for you. Uh, I typed into a Bible search engine the words light and dark and darkness and related terms, and I find out there were 398 separate Bible passages from cover to cover that use that imagery. I had a chance just last week to read every one of them, and what I found out was pretty cool, that when the Bible speaks about light and darkness, the five principal meanings of that metaphor fit into the acronym L-I-G-H-T. In fact, if you're here live in church, I want you to grab a pen, because what we're going to do for the rest of this message is to unpack that. Jesus said he is the light, the L-I-G-H-T. If you're watching at home, make sure you grab a piece of paper and write this down. But I am going to admit up, up front before you take notes, this isn't, it's not my best acronym. Um, there's going to be one time or maybe two times where you put the pen down, you're like, come on. <laughs> That's, like if there's an award for the best acronym of the year, uh, the acronemies or something, I, I probably wouldn't have to prepare a speech. <laughs> I wouldn't be winning any awards. So I get it. Um, but here's my goal, that when you get in the car after church or when this program is done, that you could turn to a person next to you and ask them, what's the L-I-G-H-T? 
And uh, even if I have to stretch a little bit, I'm hoping that you remember these five things about Jesus and what he meant when he claimed to be the light of the world. All right, grab a pen. Let's jump in and write the first one down. The L in L-I-G-H-T stands for life. Light, both in the Bible and in nature, is connected to life. If you're in the light, you have life. If you're in the darkness, that's connected to death. If you remember your fifth grade science class and photosynthesis, that should make sense, right? Uh, how many of you have plants in your home? Just curious. Hands nice and high. How many of you store those plants in the darkest room of your house? <laughs> you kill all the plants, sir, yes? <laughs> well, you're going to learn a lot today. <laughs> right, well, why? Well, because the way that plants work through photosynthesis is that life happens, they grow, they survive by receiving the sunlight. Now, Jesus is saying the same thing spiritually. And he's actually saying something very big. Did you notice his words? He didn't just say, I'm, I'm light, but I am the light, the definitive, not just light of my family or light of my community or light of my ethnicity. I am the light of the world. It's a huge, controversial, pretty exclusive claim. Jesus says, if you want to have life with God, if you want to have eternal life in heaven, there's only one way to get it, and it's through me. If you thought, you know, just trying your best to be a decent person gives you life with God, nope. If you think like many people that just believing something or having faith in some higher power will give you life with God, he says, nope, nope, nope. Well, just be religious and devout whatever your religion is. Unfiltered Jesus says, nope. No, I'm not one path up the mountain to the light of heaven. I am the light of the whole world. Whoever follows me, he says, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, some people think that Jesus was accepting of everyone's beliefs, and this passage is proof that he was not. He made huge claims that he was the only way to the Father because he is the light of the world. But before you kind of get offended by Jesus and walk away, notice what he said. I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will have the light of life. I love that phrase, whoever. Did you know that most world religions that billions of people follow today would not be able to say that? Most religions say whoever is fairly good will have the light of life. Whoever has shown noticeable improvement from their past will have the light of life. Whoever keeps these Ten Commandments or these five pillars or these eight principles, whoever's fixed their karma, balanced out the right or the wrong, the world religions say, you better be doing good and you better be doing a lot of it. You better avoid the bad or else all of you are in trouble. But Jesus does not say that. He's the only religious founder who says, whoever. You got some stuff in your past? Okay. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. You got a rap sheet? Does the local judge or cop know your name? Have you been through a divorce? Is there addiction in your past? Are you struggling with some moral issue, some sin that you keep going back to that maybe you went back to just in the last week? Well, thank God. Jesus does not say whoever is good, whoever is better, or whoever has grown in the last year. He just says, and I quote, Whoever, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Yes, Jesus is exclusive, but he is also amazing. He is offering you, despite your past, despite your present struggles, he's offering you free of charge, no strings attached, the light of his love, which leads you into life with God. You can run from him, but he's offering you, despite all of your flaws, light and life. So that's the L. I grab your pen for number two because the L-I-G-H-T, the I stands for I see. All right, this is a little bit of a stretch, right? You're like, eh, let's, 
That's unimpressive. Don't you have time to work on this, Pastor? I was going to put illumination, but that felt like a big word. But this is really the simple concept, right? If the lights are on, I see. If it's really dark, I don't. If the lights are off, I feel doubt. I have to guess. I'm unsure. But if the lights are on, it's actually pretty simple. How many people right now in this church service are sitting in the front row? Yep, that was easy. Because of light. If we killed all the lights and you asked me how many people are sitting in the fourth row, I'd have to guess. <laughs> By saying that he is the light, Jesus is saying that there are some really big questions everyone's asking about life and you don't have to guess because of his light you see. If you don't have Jesus though, you're kind of in the dark. It's easy to be deceived and the best you can do is guess. Um, actually makes me think of the time that uh, my wife and I almost got, got eaten by a predator in northern Thailand. Did I ever tell you about this? Um, Kim and I were on the other side of the world. I got to speak to some Christian missionaries there and they put us up in this big complex. It was amazing. It was huge. And they had a zoo right in the middle of it and all these walking paths and like beautiful trees and stuff. Well, Kim and I like to run. So one morning we get up and it's early and it's really dark. And by dark, I mean like not American dark with sidewalks and street lamps. It's pitch black. It's so dark, we can't even run really. We can't see that far ahead of us. So we're kind of jogging, shuffling really slowly, barely seeing like the sidewalk a foot in front of us. The, the paths all twisted and turned. We got totally lost and we were like in the middle of the zoo and we turn this corner and what is in front of us but two giant animals. I see their silhouette in the really dim light and I see their eyes, not this close together, but this far apart on their massive heads. Uh, we gasp, we stop dead in our tracks. Obviously, I take Kim and put her in front of me. Like, 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 oh, we, we stop, we, we yelled out loud, we turn around, we try to run, we're trying not to crash into each other, we're, we're taking off into the darkness. But then a few hours later, the sun came up and we went back to see what animal almost devoured us. I'll show you a picture of what it was. <laughs> I ran for my life from two giant shrubbery bunnies. Yes. <laughs> It was a fancy hotel. They turned their bushes into giant beasts. We thought, we thought we were about to get eaten. We thought. It was our best guess in the darkness. Right? You ever notice how we, we think a lot of things that aren't always true? Jesus says, I'm the light of the world because he means he wants you to see what's true. There's some really smart people in our world who have fancy degrees and titles, but if they don't know Jesus, they don't, they don't see the simple answers to life's biggest questions. It feels very you know, scientific and philosophical to say, well, where, where did we come from as human beings? I, I know. In the beginning, God created he knit us together in our mother's wombs. We, we are not accidents of evolution. We are intentionally created by a loving father. Much like a mother and father, the overflow of their love leads to a child. The overflow of God's love led to you. You're not an accident without purpose. You, you're part of the family of humans that God made. Oh, but what happens after death? That great mystery, no one knows. I know. <laughs> I know a guy who died and then he came back to tell us about it. He said that whoever believes in him will live even though they die. Our, our back pain and our anxiety, our relational struggles, death and mourning is over. We, we immediately go to paradise to see the face of God. I, I know. Well, how do you get right with God? How do you know you're on the good side of the divine? Yeah, in the back, you again? Yes. Yeah, well, well, Jesus told me it was actually very simple. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Well, what's the purpose of life? What does God want me to do? It's such a mystery. No, it's not. 
God doesn't care if you work here or there. He just cares that you love people wherever you are. So stay here. Sell your house. Apply for this job. Apply for that one. God doesn't care. He, he just cares that you love him and love people wherever you are. These things that keep us up at night, that philosophers debate. Jesus says, if you follow me, you will never walk in darkness. You will see the truth of life, death, your past, your present, and your future. What a beautiful confident thing not to stumble around and shuffle in the dark, but to know who you are, to know where you're going, to not fear life or death, because God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. So we covered the L and the I. Let's jump to the G. G stands for growth. Probably know that if you've ever had a plant before. It's actually true of our mental health too, right? It can be tough to get out of bed, but there's something about lights that helps us to grow. It grows our joy and our peace. Um, I forgot this about photosynthesis, but I believe you know, light is soaked into a plant cell. It grows to the point where it divides, which stretches out the stem and the leaves and produces fruit. And so when Jesus is saying here, I'm the light, he's saying that if you want to grow spiritually, if you want more love in your life or peace with God, or patience when things are just not going according to your plan? Well, the simple answer is the light of Jesus. That's why we're so infatuated here at our church with this book. So I love seeing your faces here in church every Sunday because even though it doesn't glow, there's light and growth in this word. And every time you go home and start your day or end your day or interrupt your day, you know, this well, actually, your phone does glow if you have a Bible app. So it's like, oh, here's, here's how spiritual growth happens. Right? So if you're just praying, God, give me peace, give me patience, those are great prayers. His answer is going to be to grow you through the photosynthesis of the soul that comes from this book. And so I'm not trying to beat you over the head with the Bible, but I am going to keep beating this message, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. You're not going to, grow 50 feet in a day like an oak tree. It's going to be bit by bit, but exposure to the light of this word is going to grow you to be more and more like Jesus. Uh, makes me think of this young man who just started coming to our church. Um, I was really excited to sit down and, and chat with him for the very first time because uh, I quickly found out from his family that they, they simply could not understand how his life had changed for Jesus. I remember talking to his sister. I was standing right there just last Sunday and she just shook her head with joy and said, I cannot believe this is my brother. His beliefs changed. His behavior changed. He's a totally different human being. And so I, I sat down with him and he's telling me about all these changes and all these changes he wants to make for God. And I was curious, so I asked him the question, like, do you read the Bible at all? And you want to guess what he said? Yep. Yep, he had just gotten into this habit, which he called his holy hour. So every morning, uh, he would get up, he would grab his Bible, maybe he'd turn on a sermon on YouTube, he'd get out his notebook. Y you learn better if you take notes, he said to me. Yep. And he told me that for 60 minutes every day, he just soaks in the light of God's truth. And I'm, I'm listening to this guy like, dang, I, I, I should do that. <laughs> you know, who would have thought? Like explosive growth is connected to a really faithful, really solid habit of God's word. So let that be an encouragement from Jesus today. If you, you just want more spiritual fruits, if you're struggling with joy or peace in the midst of all these uncertain things in your life, what if instead of sitting, waiting, worrying, you spent the first 60 minutes or 30 minutes or 15 minutes or five minutes letting the light of this truth grow your heart and grow your faith? L-I-G- that brings us to the H. Uh, the H is the hard part because the H in this acronym stands for harsh. Uh, you know this about light. If you've been in the darkness for a while, light is harsh. Um, when I was in middle school, I'm not sure if this is true for you, I could sleep past lunch. Anyone else have that spiritual gift? <laughs> 
So eventually my mom would be like, lunch is getting cold. You have to, you know, bust open the door and whip open the curtains. And if you've been in the dark, light, despite all of its warmth and beauty, is, is painful. You know, you want to hide from it. You ever been camping with friends around a fire on a really dark night and someone turns on their headlamp and looks at you? Ah. If you ever been inside a movie theater during a, a matinee show and you step out into the light, ah, it's, eventually it's beautiful, but the first moment if you've been in the darkness is painful. I remember, in fact, when I was in high school, uh, I thought it would be cool if I would wear clothes from Abercrombie and Fitch. And I always remember, like, the dressing rooms at Abercrombie and Fitch, the, the lights were really, really dim. And I would try on their clothes and think, dang, I look good. <laughs> And then I get home with the same clothes and I like turn on the bathroom and I'm like, oh, wow, what, hap- what happened? Right? Light exposes things. Light shows something as it really is with all of its flaws and Jesus is the light, which means when his truth and his word shines brightly on you, you can't hide. It exposes, it judges, and that's why some people hate Jesus. Actually, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, look at what it says just verses after the God so loved the world passage. John adds, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Now, Jesus' light is crazy bright. And if you love your darkness, uh, you will hate this Jesus. Jesus isn't accepting excuses. He's not turning down the lumens on his truth. If you come to Jesus, if you read his word, if you do life with people who love the word of Jesus, if you come to a church that loves the word of Jesus, it will expose you. It It won't just accept you as you are. It will show you what's wrong, judge it, and ask you to change it. It's really important. I'll I'll be candid with you. This is the very, very hard part about Christianity. Jesus is God, and you're not. That means if we find something in that book that doesn't line up with your life, we're, we're not changing the book. We're asking you to change. Right? There's no update on the New Testament. There's no modernizing Jesus' morals. He's God, he's timeless, and he's always right. right? And, and that will expose you. You will feel judged in sermons and services and conversations because that's what light does. If there's some part of your lifestyle that you're keeping in the dark for yourself, Jesus will shine his truth on it and it will be painful. You'll want to run back inside, hide under the covers, get away from this harsh, judgmental light. Uh, for example, if, you know, if you're a, a dad who acts very religious and brings the kids to church, but the kids see behind the scenes that you are very unlike our Heavenly Father, that you threaten and you control and you use anger and you're verbally abusive, like Jesus He hates that. Mm -hmm. The greatest misuse of God's name is not someone dropping Jesus' name like a swear word. It's someone who claims to follow Jesus, but behind the scenes, they're nothing like Jesus. If you think that we're going to accept your lifestyle because it's natural for you, it's just in your heart and you didn't choose it, what? what? If you're a sinner, why would we trust your heart? Why would I follow mine? There's not perfection within us. We're a fallen human race. We don't, can't trust our instinct. I feel it, therefore it's good. That is such unbiblical logic. And the light of Jesus' teaching will shine brightly on you. It will call you to repent, change, suffer, whatever you have to, to faithfully follow the teachings of Jesus. If you think that just because you're religious and go to church, you can be a jerk to other people, You can jump online and post whatever you want because you're right. And the Bible says you can know every last scripture in the whole book, but if you don't have love, it's nothing to God. It's not impressive to him. 
He doesn't just care about Bible jeopardy. He cares about people who behave like Jesus. Right? And so there will be times when you absolutely will be judged by Jesus. And 99% of the time, the way that you will be judged is through Jesus' faithful people. Foolish people who love darkness and hate the light run from Jesus' people who are holding an open book that beams light. And uh, I'll put it out there. I, will you run from it because it's painful? Eventually, my, my experience is that your eyes adjust, you come to trust God, and even if it's hard, you enjoy the warmth and the light and the growth and the ability to see. But some people don't, never get that far. They run from it because they think God's job is just to say yes to everything they want. That's not true. It's not true. There's one Lord. It's not the person you saw when you were brushing your teeth today. It's Jesus. He's right. Sometimes we are wrong. He's the light. And sometimes the light is bright. But I hope you don't leave Jesus because there's one last thing he wants to offer you. Uh, the T in L-I-G-H-T stands for Safety. I know. All right, I know. You can, you can roll your eyes. <laughs> but that's true, isn't it? Um, the dark is really dangerous. When the lights are on, there's much greater safety. Just imagine for a second if we killed all the lights in this space and you had to leave. You'd stub your toe. You'd run into someone. I might fall off the edge of the stage. But if the lights are on, it's actually very safe. You see where you're going. You know where the danger is. And that's what Jesus is saying to you, that if you follow him, what's his quote? I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. It's his way of saying, you will never be in danger. You could lose your job. You could lose your relationship. You could lose your ability to walk or talk, but you will never be in spiritual or eternal danger because I am the light. In fact, it's pretty cool. In the original Greek language um, that the New Testament is recorded in, it's probably a, a touch better translation to say this, that Jesus said, whoever follows me will never, ever, ever, ever walk in darkness. It's a, an emphatic grammatical term. Jesus is saying categorically, if you have me, if I am your light, you will never, ever, ever be in danger of the darkness of hell. You'll never, ever have to wonder if God's going to accept you or condemn you on the last day. You'll never, ever, ever have to feel like you're alone because God will be with you and you will never, ever, ever have to think that you're unloved because you're not. You'll never, ever, ever have to question your place in God's family. You'll never, ever, ever have to wonder if you have God's ear or his heart. If Jesus is your light, he saves you from all of that danger. When we say that Jesus saves, it's our way of saying that Jesus keeps you safe. You're never in the danger of missing God in life, in death, or in the life to come. He's offering you all of that absolutely for free because he says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but have the light of life. So put it all together and what do you get? Jesus is the source of life. He's the way you see the truth. He's the way you grow spiritually. He can be harsh, but he offers you safety with God now and forever. You want to guess how people reacted to that? I'll show you. In the context, John chapter 8 says, the Pharisees challenged him, but many believed in him. Once again, the unfiltered Jesus didn't take everyone's side. He spoke the truth. Some ran from it. A few followed it. So how about you? I will not promise you that Christianity will be the easiest path or Jesus will be the easiest God to follow, but I can promise you this. If, if you do, by the grace of God, you will have light and growth and safety forever and ever. I just want to leave you with one last picture. Uh, my favorite artist picked up on an old uh, Greek parable. Some of you might know Plato's allegory of the cave where all these people are trapped in darkness. Their whole lives, they just stare blindly at the wall of a cave where their masters project shadows. They never see what something really is. 
Uh, this artist is saying all of us are like that by nature until, until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes. Uh, until that blazing dove, that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, turns our head not to shadows and symbols, but to the light of Jesus. And, and he beams with brilliance and glory, with truth and holiness. I, w- I wonder if it was tempting to turn back into the shadows, but there's something about Jesus that you see in this picture that makes him worthy, no matter how hard or harsh his teaching can be. Do you see it? The scars in his hands. The blood that he shed. The proof of his love. When you were far from him, he died for you. When you had nothing to offer him, he bled for you. He is this brilliant life and he is worth staring at for the rest of your life. Turn to Jesus. You won't just see the truth. You'll see the light. Let's pray. Um, Jesus, I, I pray today for all of us here to have the eyes to see you. Um, there are billions of people who say they worship you and there are even more billions who don't. Um, this is how it's always been. Um, so we pray, Jesus, that you would open the eyes of our heart to believe that you're good and that you're worthy, that you're deserving, that however difficult it is, however narrow the road, however heavy the cross that we have to carry as we deny ourselves, that it's so worth it. If, if you're a God who gives light and love and eternal life in the presence of the Father, it, it must be worth it. So God, I pray for everyone here today, including myself, who's so tempted by the here and the now, the short-term pleasure that unbiblical lifestyles can offer. God, it, it is easier to live for ourselves, to follow our hearts and our truth. But if we follow your truth, your heart, it leads to something infinitely greater. So give us faith to see it, give us hearts to believe it, and we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Helpful tips from Pastor Mike, reminding us to use light to stay close to Jesus. This month, we're offering Pastor Mike's new book, Jesus Hashtag No Filter, as our featured resource. Filled with the truth about Jesus, this book helps you navigate through the distortions we hear every day to get to the real Jesus, who can offer you forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Request your copy with your financial gift to Time of Grace. Would you pay more attention to me if I did this? Or this? How about this? We live in a world that likes to put the filter on, don't we? But what if some of God's best blessings came from truth without the filter? That's what my brand new book, Jesus Hashtag No Filter, is all about. It dives into some of Jesus' toughest teachings, but reminds us that within them we find unfailing love, stable truth, and God's help for our toughest times. It proves to you why Jesus, he may be difficult, but he's always worth following. Jesus Hashtag No Filter is our way of thanking you for your financial support. Request yours today by calling 800-661-3311, visiting timeofgrace.org, or writing us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201. Do you ever wonder if you're saved? or what saved even means, or what God is like, or what Jesus did. Some people are embarrassed to ask these really basic questions, but please don't be. They're the most important questions you could ever ask. And that's why I want to give you a brand new copy of this little book I wrote called The Basics. Uh, You can get your paper copy, or your digital copy, or your audio copy, or your video version just by going to timeofgrace.org slash thebasics. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. Do you need prayer? Contact us and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.